Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming in and uh, uh, listening to me on this topic. I think it's a pretty important topic. Um, cloud access security broker, or as uh, Gartner calls it, uh, a cloud access broker. Uh, the word access, I think, is a, a misnomer because it's, it's not about uh, um, identity and access management. It is, uh, it is a control that you put uh, in your network to um, extend those controls out to SaaS apps, and that's what we'll talk about. My name is Ken Dickey. I'm an AVP at uh, Cadre Information Security, based out of Cincinnati. We have uh, local people here. And uh, I do these presentations at uh, local ISA chapters throughout our territories. You know, I, I, I'm a big believer in supporting the community, and I thank you for having me. So, um, CASB came about, uh, there about, about 2012, first features started showing up on the market. And, uh, you know, as we'll see here, we're going we're gonna to talk about the evolution uh, of CASB as it came up. Um, through the years. So, you know, we're all familiar with the traditional security model that we've all spent our careers implementing and maintaining. We have our uh, data center, regional offices, and a security stack that consists of uh, many controls that we implement into our network to make sure we know what's going on and can control uh, bad things and, and stop malicious behaviors and activities from happening. All the way from uh, next-gen firewalls, IDS, IPS systems, uh, secure web gateways, or proxies. Everybody remember proxies? Still very important. Uh, email gateways, malware sandboxes, and of course, uh, DLP solutions. So the uh, standard uh, traditional security model has uh, has exploded, and, and the edge of your network just, just no longer exists these days. So um, the next thing to come up was basically infrastructure as a service, where your um, applications and uh, other um, back office functions are being run in uh, an infrastructure as a service provider. Um, there was a slow ramp up to trusting these organizations. It's basically running your stuff on somebody else's computer. Um, but you were able to implement the same types of controls you had in the traditional model in the um, infrastructure as a service providers. They had virtual versions of firewalls, IDS, IPSs, all of the controls that you had in corporate you could now extend to an infrastructure as a service provider. And trust started coming up um, for these solutions through various um, um, regulatory bodies who um, take a, a deep look at how these organizations are running their business to give you a level of assurance that the um, security controls that you would expect be run in these infrastructure as a service uh, providers um, were being adhered to. So it's, it's very, very important that um, these governing bodies actually certify these infrastructure as a service companies. That really doesn't have much to do with, with CASB. So um, the, the need for CASB came about as SaaS applications, software as a service being required. Because here you are, you're no longer running these applications in an infrastructure that you control, whether it be local, on-prem, or in an infrastructure as a service provider, these are applications that somebody else is maintaining. They're in charge of uh, version control, they're in charge of all the things that you're traditionally in charge of uh, uh, taking care of. And, you know, this number keeps growing. Even, even from the first time I presented, it was at 15,000. And uh, the latest cloud report came out from Nexco, who we partnered with, um, and, and we're up to 22,000 different apps, you know, and I, I took a look at uh, um, just a brief um, LinkedIn article about the number of marketing startups that are um, just being funded in Israel alone. There's 120 different marketing 
uh, startups that are, are coming out of Israel alone. That doesn't account what's going on here. So, so, so what's up with these apps? Um, most of them are put together very quickly using agile development practices, and they are brought to market as quickly as possible so that those organizations can monetize their investments. And so one thing a CASB provider uh, does for you is they actually look at uh, how ready that organization is to house your data. And when you look at the various um, line of business uh, applications, you can see that uh, with very, very few exceptions until you get to the storage area, um, they really haven't caught up to modern day enterprise ready uh, applications. So, you know, that, that, that really does pose um, a risk because while your organization may sanction uh, select few SaaS applications for your users to use, you're all familiar with Microsoft's uh, strong learning tactics right now to get you to use Office 365. Um, you know, those moves, those calculated moves, are only a small percentage of the applications that are actually used within an organization. And so uh, most CASB vendors will provide a, a free discovery service to help sell their product, of course, but during that discovery service, they're averaging close to a thousand applications that are discovered within an organization. And, and an early adopters of CASB has been highly regulated organizations, uh, large financial institutions, um, insurers, uh, medical uh, device providers. I was at the RSA conference this year, and it was a rock the CASBAH session. And, you know, the four CIOs that were on the panel uh, talked specifically about discovering uh, the business-led apps that they didn't know about, uh, but more importantly, the, the unsanctioned user-led applications. So it's very important so, uh, to understand exactly what's going on in your network. Um, and, and it extends beyond what your with your firewall logs and your proxy logs are telling you. So um, it sort of leads into the risk. You know, what's the risk of allowing all these uh, unsanctioned apps to run within your organization? And the answer is it's, it's very risky. So um, the latest cloud report um, came up with a few tidbits. And pardon the fud here, but i got to include a little bit of it. So on average, there's 26 pieces of cloud ma malware uh, in the enterprise. And, the, and these numbers come from real discovery processes, real discovery um, cycles within uh, organizations who have signed up for it. And 55.9% of malware uh, infected files are actually shared with others, either within the organization or publicly to external users, uh, both of which are bad. So huge amount of risk there. And, um, you know, they, they looked at the probability of a data breach when you introduce SaaS applications. And it's, um, they came up with a number that's three times more likely uh, to have a data breach. And the last about little bit of FUD here is that 62.3% of cloud apps that, that don't um, have terms and conditions that do not specify uh, that the customer owns the data. Most of these cloud apps um, consider the data you put in their application to be theirs. And, uh, you know, you're fine as long as you're paying the service and the subscription for that. But what happens when you terminate uh, services of that manufacturer? So, um, you know, we I really want to get through these five slides. You know, it's, it's tough to encapsulate uh, the thoughts behind the five steps, the five strategies that you should adopt in order to um, bring uh, SaaS apps under control. And, and one is you have to have credibility with your peers. You have to have a discovery process that allows you to quantify exactly what is happening within your organization not only with users within the uh, confines of the perimeter, but your 
remote workforce out there. You have to be able to articulate uh, the challenges and, uh, and gain buy-in by um, having the knowledge up front that uh, these things are happening right now. They pose a huge risk to the organization. And uh, it will actually give you um, some uh, credibility with the uh, line of business owners and, and C-level executives. So, you know, and, and knowing the enterprise readiness of those is another value that, that the CASB products offer. So, um, what goes into determining whether or not an application is enterprise ready? Well, um, most of them look at um, and present to you general information about the application, how long they've been around, where are they headquartered, where are their data centers, where do they host that data? Because with the privacy laws uh, coming into play, you need to be very aware as to where that data is being stored. You know, how long have they been registered, whether they're public or private, uh, all the way down to um, what uh, regulations or compliance regulations they've achieved within their organization, and uh, all the way down to um, AAA uh, features, like uh, whether or not they offer uh, restriction of access by IP address, or supporting uh, multi-factor authentication, or single sign-on through ADFS and, and other means. And of course, how do they treat their data? You know, whether or not they encrypt their data at rest. Even if they do encrypt their data at rest, they own the keys. You don't own those keys. So, you know, you have to know whether or not you need to think about uh, encrypting the data before it even gets up there. And, uh, of course, uh, SSL hygiene, making sure that they have uh, strong ciphers in place and that they're not vulnerable to the latest attacks. So all of those risk factors go into uh, deciding whether or not a SaaS app is enterprise ready. So the second strategy is understanding uh, the role of cloud within an organization. Um, it, the, the days of, of uh, denying access to things you're, you're not aware of are, are over, you know, because companies are realizing that they can increase their top line growth by uh, implementing agile development cycles and making sure that uh, uh, more thorough testing and, and, and increasing their competitive advantage. Uh, there's cost savings involved. They can spin up as much infrastructure as they need to roll something out with uh, uh, pay-as-you-go models and, and, of course, a lower barrier for entry. So companies and lines of business are, are looking to the cloud, and uh, it's a good strategy. Um, it, it's amazing how quickly things are moving. So the third strategy, the third thing you should uh, make sure you're in front of is, is collaborating with the heads of those lines of business, making sure that you're involved in those meetings that, where, where these things are discussed. You know, these peers have to be uh, your champions, and they have to ultimately have your back if things go sideways, because things always go sideways, right? Um, so, so your vision should align pretty closely with what they're doing and what their strategy is, but you have to know their strategy in order to uh, do that. And it, it should be staged, um, and you should overestimate uh, the investment needed to get there. Your first few SaaS applications is the learning curve for you because it's, it's you haven't done it yet. So it's something you need to... Uh, build a learning curve and learn your lessons over time. And then uh, um, consider how you're going to deal with shadow IT, uh, those unauthorized apps that your users are using because they think it's an easier way to get things done or uh, malicious activity, but you have to have policies around how to deal with uh, the unsanctioned applications. And then the force is to actually implement um, um, safe cloud ena enablement. And, and this can be done by uh, traditional methods. First, you, you have to discover what's out there. You have to know what's out there before you can make um, good decisions on, on how to control that stuff. You have to find out how many cloud apps are running and, and how users are using it. 
uh, being able to drill down into risky usage of that sensitive data. You know, you can have a, a high-risk application that's okay to use because the data going into it is, is very low risk, you know, like brochureware and a marketing app, you know, something that, that really doesn't have that much value to malicious users. And by the same token, you, you can have a very uh, secure app uh, that is enterprise ready that, that still poses some risk and you need some controls around DLP and encryption and tokenization. And being able to get to where you can have granular control and say, yes, you can use that apps, but sorry, we're not going to let you upload things to it, or we're not going to let you download from it. Uh, so having a granular control over those applications. Oops. There we go. Um, and then um, you got to tie it all up and above. you got to basically have a strategic roadmap so that you can... Um, consistently uh, evaluate new SaaS apps that are brought to your attention by those line of business owners who you have relationships with and be able to um, uh, very quickly establish uh, the risk involved so that they can ascertain the risk involved in working with that SaaS application and, um, and feeling and, and creating a sense of co-ownership. So that, uh, you know, there's, there's never a battle behind it because there's, there's usually a good business case uh, behind usage of a lot of these apps. And, and you know what? When things go right, make sure you praise these guys and uh, um, keep on the praise and make sure that uh, their success uh, and the success of their, their uh, project is, is tied to your success. So if they win, the business wins, and, and you all... Uh, will have made it happen through very good planning. So let's take a look at uh, a few of these um, cases here, the requirements and how to solve them, because uh, CASB, as you'll see uh, coming up, uh, encompasses a wide range of features and a wide range of controls. So it starts at the basics here, basically discovering what's out there. And you can do that through uh, various uh, means, some more granular than others, but it's very important that you get a deep understanding of what's going on in the cloud, um, what's being used, um, even identifying a duplicate usage. I mean, uh, the line of business might have a marketing app that they want everybody to use, but everybody's saying, hey, this one works better, I'd rather use that. So you have to make sure you can make the line of business folks aware of uh, overlapping applications that are being used and uh, you know finding those redundant apps and, and, and assess the risk you know making sure you look at those risk factors behind the SaaS app that you're adopting to um, make sure that you can provide that input back to the security and compliance folks. Second is, uh, of course, to uh, safely enable those sanctioned apps. You know, um, you need to have uh, apply the same um, governance and uh, risk and compliance rules that you've uh, formulated for your business uh, to these applications. So that requires granular visibility and the ability to um, uh, discover new apps as they come up and uh, block ways uh, to route around them. And, and detect and remediate things such as malware. You know, that's that's a feature that select few CASB vendors have, the ability to apply threat intelligence to the data it sees. And, and also utilizing uh, uh, machine um, learning-based uh, anomaly detection. You know, user behavioral analysis and network behavioral analysis is uh, the new thing that everybody is looking at. And, uh, you want to make sure that you can implement that within your, your CASB solution. I'm sorry. Is there a Dave Woodsy? Dave? Is there a Dave? And also making sure that you can integrate that solution um, with uh, your, your existing security tools. So, I mean, in this, this example, you know, Bob in accounting, he's uploading uh, some customer data to OneDrive. Uh, it's it's a sanctioned app. Um, well, oh, no, it might not be a sanctioned app. Those are the sanctioned apps. So he's going to OneDrive, but he's doing it from his mobile phone. You 
know, which, which isn't a compliance type of uh, activity. So those are the things you can discover within uh, a CASB solution. So um, the last requirement is around consistent granular governance for all the apps that you've sanctioned. Uh, as well as the shadow IT app. So, again, being able to discover what's being used, being able to identify the shadow IT and, and gain control over them, and having visibility and control access to all the cloud apps, and, uh, making sure you can do it from any device, whether they're within the perimeter of your network or outside the perimeter of the mobile workforce. Um, making sure you can identify and uh, stop um, data loss. Um, DLP solutions should be able to be integrated with your Canopy solution, either via a cloud-based offering or in tandem with your uh, and in tandem with your on-prem DLP network DLP solution. And making sure that you can uh, uh, show compliance to those auditors who are inevitably going to come around and ask about how that app is being used. So this is the part I like because, you know, I, I came up as an engineer. I've deployed firewalls and proxies and other controls throughout my career. So where, where does it fall within, you know, the, the quasi-OSI model here? Um, layer 4 and below, you got your own firewalls, IPSs, and UTMs. Those days are long gone. Uh, today, you have next-gen firewalls and web proxies. As you'll see later, those firewall, uh, next-gen firewall and web proxy manufacturers are very quickly gobbling up CASB startups because they realize that they have the technology and inner workings within them to um, serve some of the same functions. And some of these functions do overlap. You know, as far as identifying applications, you know, one, one popular next-gen firewall out there is, is all about uh, app control, you know. Their, their, their claim to fame is their app ID engine, and they do it very efficiently. But, but they've never, um, probably never expected the, the number of SaaS apps out there to expand beyond tens of thousands. Um, so with CASB, you're able to look at uh, uh, the app layer and above. So you're able to see the activity that's going on. You're able to see the data that's being stored within those CASB, within those SaaS applications, and, and uh, allowing for control and safe enablement. So, so let's take us uh, a step further. This is, this is a, an example that I like because, you know, in, in the old world, you get these this level of information out of your proxy or firewall logs. You've got uh, a web session that started. You can see the person log in. You can see where from in the browser they're using. You can see where they're going. You can uh, um, see what type of HTTP operation they're doing. Uh, you might be able to look into the headers and, and, and uh, perhaps the post body itself and do a little filtering. And um, your SIM presents you with this information. You know, with a CASB device, you get a much more richer uh, feel and uh, uh, feedback from this same session. So we can say, see that, yes, Mary logged in, uh, but she used her, her Gmail account as her box ID, you know, and she's logging in from a MacBook, which isn't a sanctioned device. And uh, the box site she's going to, the data is actually going into Germany, you know, and um, that might be um, a violation right there. And, and by the way, she's sharing it with a guy named John from, from Nuco, who's probably a competitor. So, and within there, within the, at the application layer, you can see that the, uh, it's, it's cloud storage, and it gives you a risk rating. And those risk ratings are used to help you in alerting and making you aware of anomalous behavior. And uh, on top of that, you can see all of the activity done within the application because the CASB provider has very detailed information on exactly uh, the operations that can be performed within a SAS app. And, uh, you know, the data itself, you can determine whether it's sensitive data, PII, PCI, or PHI, and uh, other classifications. So, so the summary you get, um, perhaps sent to your SIM or, or whatever 
uh, dashboard you'd like is much more rich than you'd get out of a traditional firewall proxy. So um, I want to go a little deeper into uh, deployment options, you know, because uh, uh, that's where I live. That's where I like to live, at least. Um, at the far left, um, you can gain some visibility by pulling your information from your web and pro uh, proxy and firewall logs. Um, some CASB, uh, most CASB vendors can, can run in this mode. They can uh, plug into a port mirror or a tap loop and preferably uh, decrypted stream and uh, give you the discovery basics, basic activity, um, how risky is it because they know the destinations that you're going and they can assign some risk, a risk level to it. Um, so you go from there to the API connector and the API connector itself, uh, most of these SaaS apps have various levels of um, API uh, functions. And the more mature SaaS apps have a rich API that allows you to see exactly what's going on, see what's been stored, see the activity level of each user, see where they've logged in from, and all this rich set of data. So um, the more mature the CASB application is, the better because they have tied into and documented and built into the product uh, the APIs for these SaaS apps and can give you a single dashboard, uh, very fine layered granularity uh, audit capabilities of what's going on within that SaaS app. So they use the API connector, they might even use the admin user for uh, that particular SaaS app. So that they can actually do uh, near real time um, visibility into what's going on. Because again, this is, this is on someone else's computer, so in order to see what's going on beyond the boundaries of your network, you need um, a connector into that application. So the API and the reverse proxy are, are the two deployment methods that are uh, most commonly used for sanctioned applications. So you'll find your CASB vendors have specific connectors into a variety of the most popular SaaS apps, Office 365, ServiceNow, and others. And um, that's the realm with which uh, the API connector and the reverse proxy comes into play. Because in the reverse proxy, and we'll see it on the next slide, it's better illustrated, but the reverse proxy um, and API connector, especially when they're used in conjunction, uh, in tandem with each other, gives you a very rich data center of what's going on. And then the forward proxy deployment method is to control unsanctioned applications. You know, your next-gen firewall and your current web proxies, they have the ability to do that. They have limited application sets, um, but they're very rapidly building in the uh, CASB uh, dictionary, I'll call it, for lack of a better term, uh, applications that are out there. But with the forward proxy, you're able to um, deploy it to uh, your remote users and make sure that you can control that mobile workforce. And uh, as well as, well, and we'll see that, that later. But the four specific forward proxy methods are using a PAC file for explicit proxy, chaining, proxy chaining from your existing proxy technology. If you have a blue code, you can chain to it. Although I'll tell you now, Blue Code's catching up on the CASB field. And um, um, using DNS. You know, through DNS, you can point clients to specific IPs or deploying uh, a mobile agent to actually uh, uh, perform the same functions when they're outside of the network. So all the way from visibility to governance of sanctioned apps to full control of both sanctioned and unsanctioned apps. So this just illustrates the previous slide, you know, in, in the example number one in a, for, in, a, in a forward proxy deployment, you basically allow real-time visibility and policy control because you can stop these sessions as you see them happening for on-prem users uh, accessing all cloud apps. 
And then uh, use case for number two is your mobile workforce, real-time visibility, being able to determine what they're up to and what cloud apps they're accessing when they're at home and not at work, um, and being able to apply the same controls. The third example is a reverse proxy, real-time visibility and policy control for um, either outside partners or uh, using IT-owned apps and for sanctioned applications. And then uh, number four, buying that API connector, getting that real-time visibility in the sanctioned apps. Any questions on deployment methods? I know it's uh, might be opening up a uh, Pandora's box here, but uh, uh, this this is what uh, a lot of people need to keep in mind when they're talking to a CASB vendor, so that you can know in your mind exactly um, what features they can offer you based on their deployment methods. So another important, very important um, feature that has uh, evolved with um, the more mature CASB solutions out there is the ability to integrate to your existing controls. Uh, nothing's more important than that. You don't need a control that you need to reinvent the wheel with. You should be able to leverage your existing controls and have that CASB solution work in conjunction with. You know, the, the automated integration to web proxies and firewalls isn't there yet. They're not going to log into an API and automatically create a rule. But that, that feature's coming. You can bet your bottom dollar that feature's coming. But for now, when you have visibility, you can at least use that visibility, that dashboard, into all of your applications and use it to create policies on your proxies and firewalls. Uh, it should integrate easily with your SIM so that that SIM can take that data and uh, incorporate it into all of the other data streams that are coming in and allow for good security intelligence framework. Um, SSL is, is, uh, is integral to uh, the product. You really wouldn't want to uh, deploy a SaaS app and have to manually manage all of those usernames and passwords. It should be integrated into your uh, in-house user store using uh, Active Directory links, or uh, ADFS, or Federated Identity Management. Um, should also integrate with your DLP. Uh, a lot of cloud providers, or, or cloud-based CAS, CASB providers, have a level of DLP, but, but it should be um, validated by your internal DLP tools, because you've spent all this time, money, and effort in um, setting your policies around DLP, um, when you implement it in the cloud, you're simply extending those same controls and policies that you've already established internally. But you can pull suspected violations and then send them on via ICAP to your internal um, uh, DLP solution and have them do a scanning and have the final say as to whether it's a violation. And, and coach the users on violations. Um, and threat prevention, being able to use those threat intelligence feeds, you know, whether that be your own threat intelligence feed or trust the CASB provider to pull in enough feeds from various sources to where they have a rich data set so that you can block the known malicious stuff that's out there. And, and also, you can't forget about your mobile workforce. You have to be able to um, control what's going on in that mobile workforce uh, being able to automatically um, deploy um, applications into the uh, user store in the MDM, um, identifying, uh, I'm sorry, automatically distributing mobile profiles, and um, uh, being able to deploy a mobile agent. A lot of CASB providers don't have mobile agents. You should look for one that has a mobile agent. And so um, I think we're just about out of time here. I just want to do sort of uh, uh, recap some of the market activity that's going to go on, just to illustrate how quickly things are moving. So, you know, um, Skyfence, uh, Netscope, um, some of these other players, uh, again, started uh, um, 
coming on board around 2012. Very quickly, other manufacturers determined that, hey, we need to get in this game. So Imperver was one of the first to see that. They bought Skyfence. They've been running with that ever since. It's a, it's a great product. Akamai pumped money into fire layers, who you'll see later on, uh, Checkpoint started using to help uh, uh, enrich their CASB capabilities. Uh, HP entered into a reseller agreement with Adalom, and then Adalom got gobbled up by Microsoft, you know, not, not uh, five months later. Palo Alto Networks, they acquired uh, uh, Ciro Secure. That's now the Aperture product, though. So PAM's Aperture product was a result of the Ciro Secure acquisition. Uh, Blue Coat. Blue Coat did two acquisitions. They bought Prospexus and noticed Oh, gee, it's not fully functional. So they, later on, they also bought Elastica to help provide the proxy technologies that are required to incorporate CASB into the proxy. And, and you'll find Blue Coat, Checkpoint, Pan, and others are all rapidly trying to catch up to uh, the Netscopes and uh, Scott High Networks. Um, and it goes on and on and on. So IBM developed their own uh, in true IBM fashion. Um, Cisco announced in their uh, Cisco Live, uh, they bought <coughs> CloudLock, which was one of the uh, last holdouts. And then just yesterday, Oracle announced they are buying Polera. But we all saw that writing on the wall because Polera was started by X Oracle. So um, that's all I've got. I wanted to um, try to keep it within 45, 50 minutes here. Um, but one thing I'd like to ask, and, and it's, it's amazing the results I get, uh, is there anybody out there who's actually implemented some level of CASB technology in the network? Anybody at all? That's the exact reaction. This is the third ISA chapter. I've had no hands raised. So you'll find that uh, CASB vendors are out visiting C-level executives, folks like me. Uh, uh, I'm now a product guy. I used to be an engineer. But I am trying to build um, not interest in the product, but uh, pointing out the need for this product set within the product. So you know, as budget cycles come into play, you might want to consider uh, CASB type solutions. Any questions? All right, then. Well, I thank you very much for your time. I hope the rest of the day is uh, productive for you. And uh, thank you.